Hey guys, I'm Louise. I'm a staff writer at Wired, where I usually cover security, surveillance, Amazon, those kinds of things. But today, I'm actually gonna go off my typical beat and I'm gonna be covering a scientific paper about a brain interface, which is a way for people to communicate with each other only using their minds. Our brains are going to interact with the physical world in ways that we can hardly imagine today. We're on the cusp of a cognitive revolution. Brain interfaces have been used to control prosthetics, synthesize speech, and even fly planes. Right. Crazy. But now, researchers are using them to allow multiple users to collaborate with each other. So we're going to do three things. First, we're going to read the paper and break it down. Then we're going to figure out what kinds of questions we have and try and find some answers for them. And lastly, we're going to reach out to the authors of the paper and other researchers in the same field. All right, so let's get started with the paper. So it's called BrainNet, a multi-person brain-to-brain interface for direct collaboration between brains. Let's see what we got here. I read a lot of papers for my job and there's always usually kind of an introduction here that backs up a little bit and talks about the topic more broadly because that allows them to then explain how their contribution is relevant. Here's a good example here. We have the first brain-to-brain -brain interface it's demonstrated by Rao and colleagues in 2013. So we could look up those researchers. So we're gonna just pull the bibliography out. You always want to kind of shout out other researchers in the field so they can evaluate the research for us. In this paragraph, they're kind of explaining what's different about their research. Those are good things to mention because you want to contextualize this research, like why are you writing about this paper? Okay, so now we've kind of gone over the basic parts of the paper and this is how their experiment works. There's three people and two of them are sending signals to a third person about a game of Tetris. The first two people kind of decide how they want the blocks to move, and then the third person receives that signal and moves the blocks so they can not let the blocks stack on top of each other. With something really out there like this, we definitely want to make sure that we have a paragraph really early on in our story that talks about some of the kinds of technologies that they use. They use transcranial magnetic stimulation and EEG technology. That's something that we're going to want to look up and try and understand more about. So here are the results. They used five groups, three human subjects in each group, and the accuracy was pretty good, 81.25%. One thing that's interesting here is that they keep making an analogy to social networks. I think that's something we might want to ask them about. So this is good. You can see some of the ethics stuff in here. Those kinds of ethics things are definitely good to look for in a paper like this because you're helping the reader to understand better the ethics considerations behind this technology. So that's almost it. Normally after I read the paper, the first step I would take is getting some basic terminology down. Okay, so let's start by learning a little bit more about transcranial magnetic stimulation. All right, here's an article from Johns Hopkins. Okay, so it uses magnetic pulses, which pass easily and painlessly through the skull and into the brain. Okay, so next we're gonna learn a little bit about EG tech. Oh, interesting, so it looks like Facebook is also working on something like this. That might be good. So this is a test that detects electrical activity. So we're just gonna make some notes about TMS and EEG. Okay, so now we're gonna see kind of like what our readers might already know about this, what's already out there about this topic. So we're just gonna type in brain to brain interface. What I'm always looking for at this point in my reporting is references to other things that people might have seen because you never want to write a story that feels really contextless so that they really come away not only understanding how that one paper works, but what they should think about this field of research. Yeah, a lot of this is about the Elon Musk coverage. So that's good to keep in mind. You can add that to kind of our question to ask the researchers. Like, what do they think of Elon Musk's proposal? That might be something we might want to ask them. A good thing to check here is I'm gonna look up Google Scholar and I'm gonna type in brain-to-brain -brain interfaces to see if maybe someone's written about this. Google Scholar is just like Google, except all of the results here are published in academic journals. Okay, so interesting. Brain-to-brain -brain interfaces, military, neurosurgical, and an ethical perspective. Here we learn that DARPA, which is the research arm of the US military, is also working on technology like this. So that's a good thing to note. Okay, so now we have a little bit of background to contextualize this research. A good place to start is just the lead researcher on the paper, so I'm just gonna look them up. Okay, great, so we're gonna send him a message. And now that we've kind of got a little bit more context, we're gonna look up some of the papers that we looked at here to see if we can find some other outside sources to comment on this paper for us. The Monkey Brain Net, it's a very good band name. <laughs> These researchers might be good sources for us. 
I also saw here an article about like the ethics of this kind of thing. So another source would be a bioethicist. An ethicist who studies brain computer interfaces. Perfect. Okay, let's see if maybe there's at least one other one. So we can see at Duke, the majority of the research is on brain machine interfaces. So that's perfect. We're gonna actually look up the main researcher of this lab. Journalists rely heavily on academics, so it's really important to ask them very clearly for what you want from them. So sometimes I read my emails a lot of times. <laughs> now I'm gonna call a senior editor here at Wired named Sandra Upson. I'm gonna see if she has any tips or advice as I'm reporting on this topic. Hi, this is Sandra. Hey Sandra, it's Louise, how are you? Hi. So what do you think of this paper? A couple things that came to mind as I was looking at it. Uh, one thing that's always helpful is to see how this paper advances what these researchers have been doing before to sort of see where the interesting research is happening. Like, what else can you do? How can you get closer to the types of information we think of when we think about, you know, beaming thoughts? So kind of ask them, how could you make this information, like, have more depth? Yeah. And my understanding is that a lot of other setups use technologies that are a bit more invasive or only appropriate for animal subjects. So this is one where anyone can participate. Yeah, that's one thing I kind of liked about this work is that they're not uh, opening anyone like, to do any sort of surgery or anything. Right, um, yeah, no implants of electrodes or anything like that. You walk away and your life resumes as it was before. Which is great. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sandra. I really appreciate your help. Yeah, anytime. It's been a couple of days and some of the researchers that I reached out to got back to me. Hey, Dr. Rao, how are you? Can you hear us? Uh, yes. Is that uh, Louise? Yeah, this is Louise. Thank you so much for making the time to talk to us today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem at all. Okay, great. So can you kind of just walk us through the experiment? And I'm really curious about why you designed it the way that you did. Back in 2013, we demonstrated the very first brain-to-brain uh, -brain communication system. And this involved uh, one sender and one receiver. So that was the very first time that uh, you know we had demonstrated that you could use non-invasive technology in humans to convey information from one brain to another human brain. Researchers didn't stop at connecting one brain to another. They introduced a third person and tested sending conflicting messages through what researchers referred to as a social network of brains. And how would you define a social network of brains? Like, what does that mean? We were motivated by the fact that currently a lot of uh, interactions between uh, humans is taking place through social media. And so there's reliable information, there's information that's not so reliable. And so the social network of brains here corresponds in a very limited way to, you know, solving the simple Tetris-like problem, but if you can generalize that, that would mean brains that can take in what it needs to and then ignore the other unreliable information. Ignoring fake news tweets and the fake brains that are telling us the wrong information. Hopefully, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the hope anyway. I think what would be great for you to explain is just how the technology works. Like, why are you having the subjects stare at lights, right? Like, what is that doing to the brain? And like, how does that actually transmit the information to the other person? There are several different ways in which you can extract information from the brain non-invasively using EEG. So the idea here is called a steady state visually evoked potential or SSVEP. So if I want to select a yes, I look at a light that's flashing at a frequency of you know 17 hertz. If I want to say no, I look at a light that's uh, flashing at a frequency of let's say 15 hertz. And so when you are paying attention and looking at a particular LED that is flashing at a particular frequency, the visual cortex, it starts to respond at that frequency to that flashing light. And then we can, we can recognize that frequency from the EEG signals we're recording. Dr. Rao explained that once a subject actually focuses on a frequency, researchers detect it using EEG signals, which are then sent to the receiver via a magnetic stimulator attached to their head. The pulses are translated in the brain as an image, which effectively shows the receiver something they aren't actually seeing. And the binary part is like, it's, it's yes or no, it's I see something or I don't, and that's the, that's the binary. Yeah. The last question I wanted to ask is, what do you want to do next? So there's uh, several different, uh, you know, uh, potential future directions that we're, we're looking at. Like, the, you know, right now we use this yes or no answer based on some flashing lights. But then, you know, if you use fMRI, you can start to extract more abstract kinds of information, uh, including potentially emotional signals, also abstract kinds of thoughts and so on. So uh, we're hoping that, you know, we can start to get at that kind of information, which would then allow us to potentially convey more complex forms of information than just a simple yes or no answer. And so we are addressing that also at the center that I'm directing. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. I really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks for a lot. Time. Now we're going to talk to a researcher at Duke who's been studying brain-to-brain -brain interfaces for around 30 years. He wrote a book about a decade ago about this technology. 
How, hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Can you hear us? Yes. I know that um, about a decade ago, well, I guess it was in 2011, you wrote a book about this topic and about what you thought the future of it would be. And I'm curious about what you think has happened since then and like where you think this technology is going. Like I know that Elon Musk wants for you to be able to type without using your hands and just thinking. I actually find it very amusing that Elon Musk is proposing things that have already been done. Everything that he proposed in terms of what is going to happen, we already done it. Some things 10 years ago. But I'm very impressed to the fact that now you have applications of brain machine interface for uh, people that have lost the ability to speak, control devices in remote environments that are too dangerous or too difficult for a human being to penetrate. BMI is being used for robot control. And there's a lot of confusion of whether you should really use non-invasive technology versus invasive technology. Invasive technology meaning getting inside the brain and putting electrodes inside the brain. That, in my opinion, should be left to very critical applications in people who are completely disabled or cannot move at all. And obviously for ethical reasons, it seems a lot easier to be doing the non-invasive research. I think that you've done some with monkeys too, right? Where you can do a little bit more invasive research than you might be able to do on human subjects. Yes, in monkeys and rodents, for instance, it's very useful to do the invasive approach because you are trying to learn about the brain. But I think the use in clinical applications and of course other applications is going to be limited by the ethical considerations, the risk, and the cost. You bring up a good point, which is right now, it seems like with these brain-to-brain -brain interfaces, you can really only communicate pretty binary information. Human brain attributes, they are primarily analog, and they are encoded in a completely different way than you do in a digital machine. So translating your emotions, or my emotions, or my intuition, my creativity to an algorithm is not going to happen. We haven't really figured out a ways to produce or to deliver messages that are more complicated. But you're never going to reach the level of resolution that you get when you're inside the brain. Um, is there anything kind of about this paper in Washington that you think is important to note or some of the limitations? How would you think about this research as you know, an expert in this area? Well, I think it's a proof of concept. This is a, an attempt to show that it can be done to some degree using a non-invasive method in humans. The only major concern I have is that we should not consider this as a possibility of weaponizing the brain, of using this technology and neuroscience to control weapons. Right, it's so great to see these people who are paralyzed be able to speak and communicate, and then on the other hand, to see like DARPA's interest in all of this, it's definitely really the opposite. Yeah, that's the reason it's important to speak up. Well, thank you so much, Miguel. I really appreciate you making the time to talk to us. Thank you, I appreciate it. Now we're gonna to talk to a bioethicist about some of the moral concerns that might arise with the use of this technology. So I wanted to kind of talk to you about uh, some of the ethical considerations with these brain-to-brain -brain interfaces and these brain-machine interfaces. We were trying to understand the phenomenology of being implanted with a brain-computer interface. So what we, we learned that actually being merged with an implantable device, which is linked with a, an artificially intelligent component, can lead actually to some radical symbiosis. This means that the uh, patient and the individual become very dependent and over-reliant on the device. Right, right. And, and just like more generally, when you're thinking about these brain interfaces, and these brain-to-brain -brain interfaces. I'm curious, as an ethicist, like what are some of the things that you're concerned about or that you, you think about? One of the first uh, ethical issues that we are seeing is when the technology is reading the brain. It's trying to select specific brain data, but in reality, it's not only looking for that specific data, it's also downloading all the data they can find in the brain, if you will. So that means that when you have the technology reading your brain, it's also pumping out some of the information that you might not want the technology to take. In addition to privacy concerns, Frederick discussed the problem of accountability. What happens when brain interfaces assist in illegal or endangering actions, either on purpose or because of the problem with the technology? Well, thank you so much, Frederick. I really appreciate you making the time to talk with us. Thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, he's done the brain to brain, but he's also done a lot of brain computer stuff. But that's like a part of this. So I feel like one of the big things we learned here is that there's technology that can pick up on electrical signals that you could actually send to another brain. I think some of the biggest things we really want to hit would definitely be the future applications and the ethical concerns. And also, where is this going? What are the things we need to think about as this technology is developing? That's always a really good way to think about framing an article. So I hope you enjoyed seeing kind of how a reporter at Wired works. It was really interesting for me to learn about this topic that I really don't usually report on.